This is The One Thing Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Adam Rindy. The One Thing Podcast brings together leaders in functional and naturopathic medicine to discuss actionable information that may unlock puzzles in the areas of gut health, brain health, metabolism, and longevity. Please note, these episodes do not replace the opinion of your doctor. They are not intended to diagnose or treat any condition. Please discuss this information with your provider and discuss your own unique personal health history before adapting this information. Please subscribe to our episodes so that you can stay on top of the most current information in these areas of medicine. In this episode, I welcome back my esteemed colleague, Dr. Jessica Pisano, and her coworker and colleague, Sabrina Vaz. And I'm doing this episode on a condition called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which is a condition that's related to the connective tissue um, that involves symptoms of hypermobility, hyperextensibility, and other tissue abnormalities. This is a condition that plagues many people and leads to chronic pain and other chronic disorders that often get undertreated and misunderstood. They call this condition a zebra. And this is something that I'm doing for specific patients in my practice. You know who you are, who have shared with me your journey on Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And I'm trying to get more information for not only myself, but for you and for all the people out there suffering from this condition. So without further ado, please listen into this most informative episode on Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome with Dr. Jessica Pisano and Sabrina Vaz. Okay, we're live now with the One Thing podcast, and we're going to be sp- speaking about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I'm here with my guests, Dr. Jessica Pisano and Sabrina Vaz. Um, yes. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, you did, Adam. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Um, well, welcome to this episode. I'm really excited to speak with you about EDS. And it's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. I've been, a lot of people have reached out to me in my practice wanting to learn more and understand this condition. So I thought we could jump right back, right into understanding how you got involved with working with EDS. And and, uh, maybe we can start with Dr. Pisano, um, if you could just share. Sure. So in in my practice, Mass Cell uh, Advanced Diagnostics, we work with a huge number of of EDS patients um, because we see that there is a connection between EDS, mast cell disorders, and dysautonomias. So um, we work with all of those kinds of rare diseases or zebra diseases, uh, as we like to say. Um, As a doctor of clinical nutrition, my role is really helping to unravel um, all of the, the food intolerances, the, um, what's driving the various issues a, a patient has, um, and, and really working on what I like to call medical advocacy, which really is a fancy term for, um, I understand all the science that goes into finding these rare diagnoses. Um, and while I can't diagnose as a doctor of clinical nutrition, uh, I work with all the top specialists. And so I tend to be the one doing all, all of the, the digging and background and advanced um, labs and, and understanding what they mean and then advise the physicians in terms of how that patient should be diagnosed. Um, it, we, we have a comprehensive practice here. We work with um, you know, my, my sort of uh, clinical nutrition level. I then have some master's level nutritionists that help with execution. Um, I have somebody that does neural retraining work. And then I have Sabrina Vaj, who is our Pilates expert, um, who is so important with working with our EDS patients. So I'll let her talk a little bit about what she does. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so basically what I do is um, I have various certifications in the fitness and, and um, exercise industry, um, but most um, particularly, I work with Pilates as a form of corrective exercise for people with EDS um, because Pilates truly is um, an exercise system that can really help stabilize um, all the really small muscles in, in the body. And it also is an amazing way of helping people with EDS learn how to stabilize through their pelvis 
creating a strong foundation kind of for their spinal column. Um, so that then, then they can take that to other parts of their body and, you know, just start learning how to move um, really with a lot of strength and stability so they're not dislocating as often. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, so the, I think that's a good place for us to start um, in our conversation. And you mentioned a number of things that people with EDS deal with. For people who are not aware of EDS, um, I sort of put in our show intro, you know, that it's at its heart, it's a connective tissue disorder um, that has certain features. Maybe if you could take us through some of the features um, and general definitions of what people with EDS deal with. Sure. So the first thing that we should really mention is that Ehlers-Danlos is a general category and there are subtypes. Um, most people have what we call hypermobility Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, that's the most common kind, but there are uh, assorted other types like classical type, which we probably um, won't be just talking about too much today. That's really when uh, people can really kind of pull their skin way beyond the normal limits. I'm talking inches away from the body. Um, there's a vascular type, which can cause early death and, and major problems with blood vessels. People usually die of an aneurysm by their 30s, unfortunately. Um, but hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is actually quite common. Um, there is no genetic uh, marker that we look for with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome as opposed to other types of genetic uh, connective tissue diseases. Um, there's still some genetic findings I tend to see when I, when I look at genomes in this population, and I've looked at thousands of them. So um, I have a lot of clinical experience. Um, and what we typically see is whereas we might need a homozygous, meaning both mom and dad give an affected allele to the child um, to, to have a particular genetic disorder. Um, with hypermobile EDS, we might only have heterozygosity, so only one allele is affected, or with homozygous non-pathogenic variants that cause it. And really what we're talking about is the connective tissue isn't going to be um, programmed properly from, from a genetic perspective, which can cause all sorts of, um, you know, subluxations, dislocations, just generalized weak connective tissue. Um, but we do see, um, you know, a sort of hypermobility through certain joints. We do what's called a bite and scale um, as a means of assessing. This is looking for uh, various kinds of um, things like do your, your knees hyperextend, meaning do they go beyond straight? Do your elbows go beyond straight? Um, if you Stand with your feet together? Can you um, bend down and put your hands flat on the floor? Um, if you were to take your hand up straight against a wall and, and sort of uh, pull back, um, does it go to 90 degrees or more? You can see mine does. I do actually have hypermobile EDS. And then finally, there's what's called thumb sign, which is basically, can you take your thumb all the way up like mine goes like that? Um, and if you can do for, for more of those, there's a very good chance that you have this. Um, but we can also see other issues. Um, uh, heart valve issues are really, really common, whether we're just talking about, um, you know, slight regurgitation issues or, um, you know, defects that actually require a replacement of a valve. All of these things can happen either very early on or as people age. Um, so, so there's those sorts of aspects, but you also have, as I mentioned, the connectivity with dysautonomias, um, and that's specifically because um, our blood vessels are connective tissue. And in every blood vessel, we have what's called a baroreceptor that, that helps to control blood flow and blood pressure, um, and that is a nervous system component. And so connective tissue being weak sets off that baroreceptor, and that's how we end up with uh, changes to heart rate and blood pressure, typically mm. low blood pressure upon standing, and then is a marked increase in heart rate at like 20 beats or more per minute above what's typically found in a seated position. Um, for the same reason, we see lots of mast cells in that connective tissue, and they like to go haywire and cause um, all sorts of uh, non-allergy but allergic type reactions that we find in our mast cell patients. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And so does someone have to go to a specialist um, to get diagnosed with EDS or can they, can a primary care doctor um, technically diagnose this? Because a lot of my patients seem to want to speak with a geneticist to kind of go mm -hmm. through some formal diagnosis. So while, you know, technically a GP could make a diagnosis, most are not particularly well informed and feel it's quite outside scope or practice. So usually you're looking at 
um, a, somebody who is a geneticist or perhaps some rheumatologist will work with it. And then you have some of these um, doctors that work specifically with the population. Sometimes they're, um, you know, physiatrists, pain management specialists, orthopedic kinds of doctors, um, allergists, immunologists because of the tie to mast cell disorders, um, and certain types of cardiologists dealing with um, dysautonomias will be familiar and might assess. Ultimately, many will get referred to genetics because one of the diagnostic criteria is ruling out other genetic connective tissue diseases. And so they do typically want to run a connective tissue disease genetic panel, make sure that the clinical diagnosis is in fact what holds true and we don't have a pathogenic variant to another connective tissue disease. I see, that makes sense. And uh, Sabrina, maybe you could comment on this. Um, there seems to be you know, this, this onset of, of the diagnosis kind of falling in line with athletes or dancers or um, performers that based on some of their ability to be hypermobile or maybe athletic in ways, they'll kind of choose certain paths and then that might lead them to um, eventually finding out that this hypermobility is, is potentially causing problems. Um, can you speak to just like the population that you tend to see um, that, you know, kind of their background and, and uh, you know, kind of comment on sort of the athletic background? Yes, absolutely. Um, definitely without question, uh, I, I think people um, who have Elos Danlos before they're diagnosed do tend to um, gravitate toward maybe, you know, maybe ballet or, um, uh, you know, even yoga or other types of uh, sports where hypermobility is, looked upon as, you know, a, a really great feature. Um, Joe Pilates himself used to work with a lot of um, contortionists and um, most likely, I mean, you know, he died in 1967, so they were not being diagnosed with um, Ehlers-Danlos, but most likely um, a lot of those hypermobile bodies that he worked with were also, um, would have been um, diagnosed with EDS. So without question, especially in the ballet world, um, which I, I was a dancer, so I can understand that, um, you know, you're constantly working on increasing flexibility. So if you, you have an easier time with that, um, you know, the ballet, the ballet world will, will um, you know, you know, really favor you. Um, if you're taking a dance class and, you know, you're the person that's able to get your leg up the highest, then you're the person who's going to make it to the front of the room. Um, so it's encouraged. Um, and I've, I've seen a lot of dancers who end up really, you know, in a lot of pain and they just don't understand why until they're actually diagnosed. Yeah. And that's what I was going to say is it's like the, the hidden world of like when they go home at the end of the day of, you know, after the dance studio or after the performance, it's like, can you share what, what it's like typical to deal with? Because I think people can conceptualize sort of pain or aches and pains from exercising and what have you, but um, I think what people don't realize is with the Ehlers-Danlos population is how different the pain is that you deal with and how difficult it is to kind of find pain relief. Well, it's not just um, even just the pain, but sometimes you might have a dancer who, you know, there's various parts of their body that will constantly dislocate. Um, I have a person I work with, she's always dislocating her rib and it was happening throughout. Like she would get, come home from dance class and her right rib, rib would be out. And she actually learned how to try to put it back, mm. um, you know, which is just a horrible thing to have to deal with on a regular basis. Um, other people just, just the pain is so severe that they can't even, they feel like they can't even get out of bed. Um, there's other parts of their body that they might, you know, dislocate shoulder, um, uh, you know, different populations. Um, the other thing that I find with a lot of people that I work with, with Elos Danlos is that they either pronate or supernate their feet. Um, and a lot of times, you know, ballet dancers in particular, and I refer to ballet dancers a lot because as I said, I was a, a ballet dancer. Um, I'm certified by the Bolshoi Ballet. Um, and in Russia, um, they take the children, um, they, you know, with, with higher um, companies like the Bolshoi and the Kirov, um, these young kids can't just go in, they have to audition. And so a lot of them have no dance experience at like nine or 10 years old when they're auditioning. Um, they have no dance experience. They're only judging them on their flexibility. Hmm. Um, so a lot of times, you know, a lot of these kids actually have hypermobile bodies and EDS and they're in a lot of pain and they're being forced to stretch out even more. 
And that is another reality. A lot of times people with EDS think that, oh, if I just stretch, like this is hurting me so bad. If I just stretch a little bit more um, and it feels great at first, but then it actually creates more pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, um, when you don't have hypermobility, there's sort of some feedback as far as how far you can take a joint, right? And you can you can kind of gauge when you're reaching to that point of you know potential um, injury or trauma to that um, to that stretch or that tension. And in EDS, is the feedback different? Um, so yes, without question, um, the feedback is different. They don't they don't feel it. So, so what I was actually saying is a lot of times. Um, People with EDS will pronate or supinate their feet. And, um, you know, so that's something that we try to work on. But in the dance world, a lot of times people, they'll pronate. So we'll, we'll say rolling in, um, but it's because they're so open through their hips. So it's a look that ballet world really likes. So it's encouraged and forced um, even more. And then the because of that opening of the hips and that forced turnout, um, you know, it, causes a lot of dislocation in the knee, a lot of dislocation in the ankle, and they're just not understanding why they're constantly rolling over their ankle or, you know, why they're, you know, their, their knee is always giving them problems. And so going back to what you were saying, um, yes, you, so the, the stretch actually is, you know, so they go beyond what, what Jessica said, it's beyond that straight line. Um, a lot of times, like if you look at a, a principal dancer, um, you'll see this beautiful leg line, but it's like the leg is no longer straight. There's like this bow to the leg that's that's hyperextended. And she's not might not even be feeling that um, at first um, until, you know, until it starts to really catch up with her. Um, so, yeah, that, there is that no point of where they're just constantly wanting to stretch and that stretch causes severe pain. Okay. And I think if we kind of take that out of the dance world and look at some of our general population that deals with this, um, because at least with a the dancer, there's a lot of uh, conditioning that's going along, there's a lot of strengthening as well as the flexibility. Um, so they can, they tend to hold it together to a certain level beyond yes. what we see in our non-dancing population that has this condition where the joints are so hypermobile um, and they don't have enough muscular control to hold that joint that they lose what's what's called their proprioception, um, which is really how we sense our body in space and time. And so we have all these balance challenges um, that arise, a lot of falls. Um, a lot of times they're they're just moving their body and that's enough to sublux or dislocate, which is going to cause exponentially more pain than somebody who has the muscle control to control the joint, which is why I actually have, you know, Sabrina as part of our team, because it's so important to get them functioning and moving, even though the, in their minds, a lot of times they're very scared to move and they don't want to do any kind of form of exercise because they think of it associated with getting injured. Um, and even physical therapy, unfortunately, rarely works just because of the way the model is set up where we typically are addressing an injury that's occurred versus looking at the entire kinetic chain. Um, but there are things you can do. Um, you know, there, there are compression garments that can be really helpful there. There's working with all the small um, muscles that, that, that uh, Sabrina is doing with patients. There's, you know, um, all sorts of um, neurological inputs that we can use, um, proprioceptive kinds of insoles and things that are out there. Um, and so it's really about exploring those, those options because in, in terms of pain relief, which is really where we started, you know, we don't want to medicate this very much because then you're looking at a lifetime of needing more and more medication to control pain levels, which typically will go up if you're not doing anything about them rather than down. And so it becomes really important that we work on stabilizing the body and getting rid of pain from the sense of having increased function so that we're not having that, that pain associated with dysfunction. Yeah. And I'll, I'll love to circle back and hear, um, more about the Pilates and the, and uh, some of the therapies that you're doing. Um, I, I want to touch upon something that I think you, Jessica, you and I have discussed is um, the digestive aspect um, and a little bit about mast cells. And um, the yeah. it seems to be that there's a, a strong link between Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and um, dysbiosis or um, SIBO or IBS, um, can you speak to that if, if you if you see that in your practice? Sure, um, I'm not sure that I would say 
SIBO specifically, usually we're going to have SIBO-like symptoms because of histamine intolerance. Um, and some of that is because of the amount of uh, mast cell, as I said, in the connective tissue directly. So the faulty connective tissue trips off the mast cell. Mast cells then degranulate, losing things like histamine and tryptase and other mediators. That causes inflammation. Um, histamine is a known cause of, of leaky gut or intestinal permeability, whatever we want to call it. And so we end up with all these kinds of problems. Um, because of that, we can have opportunistic infections. Um, and we often see that in our EDS patients, we can have acquired or um, so meaning they, they happen because of an infection or um, genetic immunodeficiency syndromes. Um, and that tends to really cause all of these chronic infections to worsen and not be able to be um, you know, dealt with by the immune system or by a typical course of treatment from a physician. Um, and so they do become this sort of lifetime kind of issue. Um, you mentioned SIBO, usually that sort of bloating kind of sy symptom after everything you eat has a lot to do with histamine intolerance rather than true SIBO. Um, occasionally we do find that, but I don't think any more frequently than in any other population. Um, and so histamine intolerance is typically um, a result of, you know, decreased function of the enzyme diamine oxidase or DAO. Um, so a riboflavin driven reaction. So oftentimes we find um, low riboflavin status in these patients and we can, that's something that we can actually work on. You also have a connection with connective tissue uh, because connective tissue requires a lot of vitamin C in order to be um, created. And vitamin C is a cofactor for or another enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase, that breaks down histamine. And so that can also contribute to the histamine intolerance we find. Um, many people with EDS have just histamine intolerance, um, but if you, you have that predisposition where the wrong epigenetic influence it could easily put them over the edge into a mast cell um, activation syndrome uh, status. And so it's something that even if we don't have it in one of our patients where we do know there's EDS, we're always making sure that we're not seeing early signs of that disease. Okay, great. And so there's um, also a strong kind of mental health aspect of dealing with EDS, just like I'd say most chronic pain conditions or um, can, is there unique approaches that you've found that you take in kind of, I know that you integrate a lot of healthcare providers in what you do. Can you speak to the mental health aspect? Sure. So there are two sides to the mental health picture. One is the sort of difficulty people have at coping with either a new diagnosis or a chronic illness that's been, you know, challenging them for a long time. Um, and then there is the neurotransmitter derailment we see with a histamine issue because histamine mm -hmm tends to um, increase all of our excitatory neurotransmitters, things like norepinephrine, epinephrine, and glutamate, while decreasing uh, inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters, things like serotonin and GABA and glycine. Um, so we can have true you know, actual neurotransmitter issues. That's something that I actually work on in the practice in terms of fixing the biochemistry for them. Um, but you, you also, as I said, have this sort of you know, fear issue, people who uh, haven't tolerated or scared to introduce a new supplement, medication, or food that could be really helpful. Um, and that's where we use neural retraining in our practice. I have um, someone on my staff, uh, Jamie Blazinski, that does an amazing job with them um, in terms of kind of giving exercises to overcome some of these uh, belief systems so that they can make progress. Um, and then I have to say, one of the biggest things that we use for, for mental health is Sabrina's work. Um, and for many of our patients, they're not willing to do the neural retraining. Um, they feel like they have it together, even though that they have this fear system in place or, you know, kind of feel like they're kind of stuck in a pattern, but they are willing to do something about their, their joint pain and understand that exercise is really important for their health. Um, and the thing about Pilates is that they can see progression relatively quickly if they're doing the work. And so that is going to be huge mental health wise just right there let alone i mean anytime you look at studies on exercise and mental health we always see positive impacts yeah yeah it's uh that's that's a really good place for us to launch into hearing more about the pilates as well you know so if if um if you're sitting down with a pa patient for the first time sabrina like 
can you give us some highlights of some of the education you do just you know as far as um what are some of the initial things that you you share with them as far as concepts Absolutely. Um, so, um, of course, every body is different, even an EDS body. Um, so, but I, one of the first things I start with is um, how just basically how they're standing and um, the placement of their feet. So, um, just kind of teaching them how that they can stand in a stable manner without allowing their weight to shift or without pronating or supinating, um, and you know, just kind of connecting. Um, and, and lifting the pelvic floor up as they stand is really um, an amazing concept for them because they're used to really kind of shifting or having a, a forward um, uh, bends. And so a lot of people with EDS tend to tilt their, their pelvis underneath them. Um, so there's all these various different postural um, issues that they have going on. So when we just try to start changing that um, from the feet upward, it makes a huge difference. So that is something that I usually start with. And even if it's somebody who might have uh, proprioception or balance issues, I can actually talk about how they stand while they're staying seated. So um, basically anybody can do the work. Um, so then we take it up to the pelvis and we talk about, you know, whether they're rocking forward or rocking back or shifting and just teaching them how to sit upright on their sits bones um, is another amazing concept because it starts to um, activate their abs and it just makes them feel so much stronger and more stable. And it's homework basically that they can do when they're not in session with me. So it has a, you know, a large impact. As Jessica said, it's, it's great for mental health as well because they're, they're feeling they're, they're, they're a success. They're, they're making a difference in their body and that's really powerful for anybody. Um, and then the other aspect of it is there's mindful breathing involved. Mm. And anytime that you get bre you know, breath flowing through the body, it's really beneficial for that as well for mental health. That's great. Yeah, I think, you know, what I'm hearing is there's there's a high degree of awareness that's probably developed through working with someone like yourself, um, which, you know, and, and technical things um, that, you know, if you're, if you're kind of going to a physical therapist that may be working on more um, movements that are kind of larger movements um, that might not, might not register, but you need more of the granular stuff of the kind of fine tuned details of like how to adjust your, your pelvis and um, how to stand, how to sit. Exactly. I can see and how that's between the movements, because typically you go to physical therapy because you've hurt your left knee and that's what they're going to work on. And maybe if you have a really good one, they'll work on the left hip or the left ankle, depending on where they think the problem is coming from, which is not by any means a dig at the physical therapist. Most of them know that they're not doing as much as they could for the patient, but that's what the insurance company will pay for, for the individual. So mm -hmm. it, it becomes one of those things where the insurance model doesn't help somebody with, with a connective tissue disease like EDS. It just puts them in this world where they start to see some improvement, but then just as they're actually making enough gains to actually be somewhat functional, they're dismissed from PT. And now they start to, you know, regress or have additional issues, or they continue to do those issues. And that joint seems to do okay for a while, but then puts too much emphasis on another joint that starts to have problems. And so it's sort of like whack-a-mole with, with these physical therapy appointments with people, you know, being in physical therapy more often than not, and you're not really seeing a whole lot of benefit. Yeah. And I could see the frustration from that. Um, and, you know, I've seen, I've come across um, specialists in hypermobility, you know, I, I know they're out there. Um, maybe we can, at the end of this discussion, we can kind of list some resources for people. Um, but sure. it's, do you, you know, as far as the pain management world, I mean, what do you, what about when people are doing all their exercises and they're, you know, they're really, you know, kind of working on things, um, being as diligent as possible, being as aware as possible, but, you know, let's say they go on a long plane ride and just flare up, like, are you, are there other things people do for pain, like internal medicine stuff that are, I mean, I know there's obviously the NSAIDs, but I can imagine if, you know, trying to cut down on those or do you talk to people about other alternatives? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes we'll use a topical CBD oil, often with white willow bark added to it. Uh, white willow bark um, is the, the botanical that aspirin was derived from. Um, so it has an anti-inflammatory property to it, um, but it also breaks down um, prostaglandin B2, which is released by the mast cell. So a lot of times our pain isn't always coming directly from the connective tissue piece. Sometimes it's also coming from the mast cell piece. Um, so that becomes a really important piece. Um, we also see a high prevalence of neuropathy in this population. Um, there is an EDS, we get these weird, mildly autoimmune-like kinds of issues that sometimes will go into full-on autoimmunity to the nervous system. And so sometimes we do have that uh, neuropathy-based pain, in which case, you know, if before, you know, until we can figure out what's driving it and get that under control, a lot of times neurologists will use medications like uh, Cymbalta or Gabapentin or Lyrica uh, to help with that. That sometimes helps to some extent. I, I personally find that, uh, you know, getting to the root of what's driving the problem tends to work better. Um, if it does turn into a full-on autoimmune small fiber or polyneuropathy, which occasionally it does, that's typically treated with uh, neurological doses of IV, IG, usually somewhere between 75 to 100 grams per month. Um, that does exponentially help the pain and decrease the neuropathy after the nerves start to heal. So there are a lot of things that you can, can do. Um, certainly, um, I mentioned the um, proprioceptive insoles or something that we sometimes use. Compression garments can be really helpful for, uh, for pain. Sometimes we'll do um, oxygen therapy in this population. So it really depends on what's going on. And then long-term, if the pain isn't alleviated by doing some of these things, um, we also do additional diagnostics because sometimes we'll find uh, cranial cervical instability um, or we'll find uh, Chiari malformations, which is basically when the brain stem is actually going into the spinal uh, cord itself. Um, and so you need to make sure that they're not somebody who absolutely is going to need surgery, although not all of those diagnoses with those conditions will. Sometimes the work that Sabrina does is, is enough, and that is preferred if, if we can prevent surgery because um, particularly with uh, cranial, uh, cervical cranial instability, they basically fuse the joint in the spine. And anybody who's ever gone through that knows that you start fusing um, and the doctors never stop fusing you and and because you continue to have more and more spinal dysfunction because we're supposed to have mobility in our spine. So if we have one spot that becomes hypomobile and the rest is still very hypermobile, you're going to have continuing pain and problems. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems, you know, there's one in 5,000 estimated people who deal with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Is that still kind of a fair estimate? Um, there's only oh, two of I you. There's only has EDS. So uh, it feels like, you know, a hundred out of a hundred in my practice, but um, yeah. Uh, there's only two of you probably an accurate number maybe a little bit more prevalent because it's so underdiagnosed um one there's a fear on the part of uh the person who the the geneticist because there there have been some there were multiple changes fairly in the last five years for the diagnostic criteria the first made the criteria so strict um, that nobody was getting diagnosed so they pulled it back so that people were getting diagnosed but um, there are still a lot of people who are scared to make that diagnosis and really only a handful of geneticists that i would say are connective tissue disease uh, experts out there yeah yeah i mean we're lucky to have one out here in the northwest and i know to get into a geneticist is usually like a long wait i've had People have to wait six months to a year. And luckily, this is changing due to telemed. Um, you know, yeah. you can you can go be seen other places without, you know, having to wait. Um, speaking of that, are you able to do um, Pilates lessons on telemed? And are you, you know, conducting some instruction that way? Most of the work that I do is... Um via zoom um it's online face facetime um it's platform is amazing because you can really see what people are doing they can really see what i'm doing and most of the time i feel like i'm right there in the room with them um in fact i've had people say to me well how did you see me doing that <laughs> and i always tell them don't worry i'm, so, I'm seeing what you're doing that's right me. Yeah. Um, but yes. So without question, um, you know, we work with people all across the country, um, you know, not just for Pilates, but with everything in Jessica's practice. Yeah. 
yeah, a lot of my patients, um, I, I think several of my patients have gone through your practice and it's um, just being been very helpful. Um, and I encourage, you know, all my colleagues to really get to know what you guys are doing because um, there's just a level of understanding that unless you unless you've seen a lot of these conditions that um, you just don't get unless you've, you've really di you dive into it. They, they don't all look alike, even though they may have some commonalities in their diagnoses. And I think that's the important thing. You know, you might be able to suss out there's something off in terms of how many injuries they have or hmm, this person's having GI issues and a lot of weird food reactions. Um, or, you know, somebody might have dysautonomic kinds of symptoms, but putting it all together and figuring out what drives it. That's a, that's a niche. And, and it's something that I've really honed over at more than, I don't know, it's probably close to 15 years of experience working with this population. And, you know, even for myself, part of the reason I can do my job so effectively is it's not just the people within my direct practice, but my contacts and, and colleagues um, that work with this population. And, you know, there are geneticists and neurologists and immunologists and orthopedic specialists and, um, you know, all sorts of other kinds of practitioners that I, I inter-refer with. And, and so, you know, that's, really important because I know metabolomics and I know genomics and I know a lot of the medical diagnoses, but at the end of the day, I can't do the physical exam and um, I can't make a prescription. And, and while I might master certain aspects of these things to be able to see it, I often need that, that input from another person because these are complex patients. And so the way I have my practice set up, which we were constantly, we, we all see the same patients. So we do these sort of grand rounds. I also do that with a number of physicians that are typically also on the team that are not directly within my practice. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, let's talk about resources um, for people um, going forward as far as if someone's sitting at home and they are convinced that this is what they're dealing with or they've been given a diagnosis and they feel kind of lost on their own trying to figure out like how to assemble a team. Um, besides, you know, I want you to um, please tell us about your practice and, you know, of course we'll share links, but um, if you could also talk about some organizations and other resources. Absolutely. So one of the first places you should take a look at is the Earless Download Society, um, which has a great uh, website with lots and lots of resources, education, um, physician directories. That's a really good starting place because, um, you know, I certainly have various relationships with, with different um, physicians and, and, and all, but, you know, knowing who's maybe local to you would be really helpful. Um, there's also links for things like um, support groups, which can be really helpful. And, and we all need that. You know, there's, there's a lot going into somebody that might have this kind of issue. Um, they have all of the diagnostic criteria. So if you're not sure whether you meet the criteria or you want to just print it out and take it to uh, your, your GP, maybe not for a direct diagnosis, but to say, hey, look, I, I stumbled across this. I think I might meet the criteria. Do you agree with me? And do, does this warrant a referral to a practitioner that really understands EDS? Because um, that's a good first step for you. I mean, you have to start someplace and you can't necessarily even get in with that top specialist until you've actually gone through that process, depending on insurance. So, you know, that that's really what I would recommend as a starting place. And then, you know, after that, you know, do you have um, symptoms that might be related to a mast cell disorder or uh, dysautonomia or, or other kinds of things like neuropathies that we do see in this population? Excellent. Yeah, those are really good resources. I also would just want to put a um, plug in for most local children's hospitals will have um, some compiled resource list as well. Um, I know like our local children's hospital, Seattle Children's, um, has like EDS friendly physical therapists um, that they can, they can uh, also provide. But like you said, that that can mean a lot of things. And, um, you know, it's, it really does take someone who's spent a lot of time working with Erlers Danlos to actually be a specialist or an expert. So, well, um, on that note, if you could just leave us with some take home messages um, and also just to 
share a little bit more about how people can work with both of you? Absolutely. So I think the take home is if this feels like a diagnosis that might ring true for you, don't ignore it. You know, especially if you're young, a lot of young people have symptoms and, and they feel like, ah, I can kind of live with this. It's, it's not going to go anywhere. And how you deal with it when you're, let's say, 20 something is not how your body's going to handle it when you're 40 or 50 something. And you haven't taken advantage of, you know, the benefits of being young and stabilizing your body versus being a 50 year old who is very deconditioned and in a lot of pain and now needing to work on it. Um, so, so go after it. Um, know that you're going to need to self-advocate because even at the GP level, you may find that there's a, like a brick wall that you hit and it's okay to fire your doctor. Anybody who's ever had any zebra disorder um, knows that not everybody's going to believe everything they see or be supportive. If that means finding somebody that is willing to do that extra work with you, go ahead and do that. Um, there are lots of us specialists out there. Um, who you work with has a lot to do with who you resonate with. You know, some patients are going to gravitate towards the person who's going to medicate and, you know, do tr very traditional physical therapy. And there's a place for that. Um, then there are other people who say, look, I've already gone that route and it only got me, you know, this much better. And you really want to kind of do some hard work yourself. That's the kind of person that's going to resonate with our practice where we're really more comprehensive and we're going to do a lot with your food and we might do supplements, but we are going to do Pilates and we might do neural retraining. Um, we might send you off uh, to work with some of the, you know, the top immunologists or neurologists or whatever it is you need. It's going to be very, very comprehensive, but that means putting the time and effort into your health. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that I think is really kind of important, because not everybody's going to be able to afford every piece that we have in our practice, um, is a project that Sabrina and I have been working on um, really through the entire pandemic. It's given us an opportunity to really concentrate on it. Um, and that is uh, we have been putting together a series of Pilates-based corrective exercise videos for the Ehlers-Danlos population. Um, so, so that's really exciting. Uh, we're hoping that the level ones, um, their, their final stages of editing, we're hoping to launch that um, sometime in, in January 2021. Um, but that's, that's really something that anybody could get involved with without even doing anything else within the practice, kind of get a taste uh, for what it might be to kind of stabilize their body. And I'll let uh, Sabrina describe the videos a little bit more in depth. Yes, yeah, so the videos are um, great. We have got three series on the first one is very basic movement. Um, so the uh, person um, can actually pick if they if they want to just work on their neck or they just want to work on their foot or, you know, maybe their knee is bothering them. Um, so they can kind of go through um, a series of exercises just um, specifically uh, based on Joe's work that would be beneficial just for whatever area of their body they're looking for. But then if they like the work and they want to progress, they can also on their same level and starting very basic level, they can actually take a few full classes that they can have in their repertoire. So even if they're, they're actually doing Pilates as a, as a regular, you know, weekly or, you know, biweekly, or, you know, even some, some people come three times a week, depending on, on what their needs is they can have this series of videos of, of actual classes that they can do when, um, when they're not actually in a Pilates session. Um, but the other really big thing for people to remember with EDS is that movement is medicine in a way too. Um, so a lot of times people think that, you know, just staying still or just kind of, you know, I'll just hang out on my couch in this kind of slumped down position and I won't have anything happen to me. That's actually going to create more pain. Um, so movement is medicine. And when they start learning to move, um, they start learning tools um, to use when they do have pain. So the, the movement can be, become um, actual medication. It's like a toolbox. So, okay, I'm, I'm on a long flight and my neck is hurting me. Um, let me make sure that I start moving, you know, and, you know, every 20, 30 minutes, I'm not sitting in one position. Uh, let me do this particular exercise where I'm, you know, really kind of adjusting my own neck. Um, or I'm, you know, kind of working on bringing my scapulars down. Um, so they start learning tools that really help them with pain relief. That's great. It sounds very empowering, which you know, I think is like getting back to the mental health aspect is like the more we're in the driver's seat, you know, the better our mental health is like the feeling of not being in control is one of the worst variables in mental health. So, um, you know, of course, you know, the, the tools and learning and all the different techniques that you're teaching us will puts puts the patient 
in the driver's seat more. And um, I really, I really like that. Um, well, thank you so much for this. Um, it's been very educational to me and I'm sure to other people. Um, again, can you just mention your website um, or the best place for people to contact you? Sure. So the practice website is uh, mastcelladvancedDiagnostics.com. Um, or if you just want to email us, it's info at mastcelladvancedDiagnostics.com. Or you can reach us um, on, at our phone number, which is 860-321-7234. Excellent. Well, thank you for being with us. Um, I will, we will be uh, posting some links in the show notes and, and uh, sharing this episode and, and playing it back for people who didn't get to see it live. And I uh, you know, look forward to catching up with you further down the road. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, Adam. Yes. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the One Thing Podcast. Please share these episodes with your friends, loved ones, colleagues, patients, healthcare providers, anyone who you feel might benefit from hearing these informative interviews. We tend to learn best from people sharing things with us. That's often the first time it's introduced. So don't hesitate if these the content of these episodes reminded you of someone that might benefit from it. Forward the, the episode to them, and I'm sure they'll either appreciate it or be appreciative that you've thought of them. So once again, we'll look forward to seeing you next episode on the One Thing Podcast. And again, much appreciation for you being here with me.